And good afternoon, everyone. This is your friendly biochemist, Dr. G, coming to you live from LTSC 326. It is Monday afternoon, not Monday evening. And we're here for the first round of discussions for biochemistry of food. Glad you could make it. So, I get the syllabus to you at some point, I know. Uh, I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. But one thing I thought we would do is, this is an eight week class, and we're gonna go ahead and run it that way. Um, I'm gonna be lecturing straight for four hours, four hours tonight, God, no. Uh, in class, we would do some stuff, talk a bit, mess around, take a 10 minute break, come back and mess around, do some stuff. And you know, that's how we do four hours. Here, no, nah, not so much. You'll be having to spend time on your own, sitting in a dark room, eating your little Debbie Swiss cake rolls for four hours by yourself. Now, so what we are gonna do though tonight is I'm still getting in the hang of this. Sorry, I keep on fiddling with this. I promise I'll stop. I'm getting the hang of it um, in terms of how this is going to roll. I'm hoping that I can actually um, do some notes on the board. And I'll be handing out um, outlines and handouts. And the general course organization is thusly. Um, we're going to do lecture stuff. I'll be dropping every Monday. And as far as exams go, we're probably going to do some sort of take-home thing. I don't know. Uh, we'll have some reading assignments to do. And <clears throat> I'm hoping to have some lab ideas that are pretty simple that I can get you guys to try at home. And we'll see how that works. Uh, hopefully nothing blows up too bad. No. But we actually have some fun experiments playing around with baking soda and lemonade and different kinds of things, and we'll see how that goes. And normally, the way we start the class is we call the roll. So when I call your name, answer here. No, I ain't got the roll. Regardless, if you're here, say here. Good. Now, what I would do is as I call the roll, I ask you uh, three things. First, where are you from? Second, uh, what is your favorite food? And third, what is your least favorite food? And if you're not a student, I always want to know where you work or what you do. That way, if I say something mean about ADM, or you know, I can apologize for it. Uh, it's just an interesting thing. All right, so I am Dr. Galuski. I'm actually from Beaumont, Texas. I've been living in central Illinois for uh, since 1997, but I'm still from Texas, sorry. And my favorite food has gone back and forth um, from a variety of things. It used to be, oh, the perfect peach has always been one of my things. I kind of, particularly in the summertime, you know, I spend all summer looking for the perfect peach. Um, and that's, that's good. I haven't had one. I had one this year, maybe two. Um, but I'm still hoping. I have decided though somebody several semesters ago asked me, is coffee food? And I thought, oh my God, that is it. And we don't have coffee in the building anymore and I don't have my Keurig with me, it's at home. And so I'm actually drinking a uh, tangerine lemongrass seltzer water. <laughs> that is just one indication about how messed up the world is. What the heck? Anyway. Uh, Coffee. Coffee is my favorite food. Now, my least favorite food is actually really easy. I have to tell you, it's anything with bones in it. I can't stand bones. Uh -huh. Totally cool with chicken nuggets. Totally. Uh, fish sticks, love them. But man, eating like a fried chicken drumstick, uh, I, knew, I know too much basic anatomy like the cartilage. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. So I'm actually very textural, I think. 
Yeah, I'm not fond of like eating something and then having some weird hard crap in your mouth like, oh, God, no. So no bones. No. Straight out. All right, what I'm going to do here, uh, uh, hopefully I can figure this out, is I'm going to actually put up a Google Doc that everybody can edit. You're going to put your name down, you're going to put where you're from, and then you're going to put your favorite food and your least favorite food. And we're developing a giant database set that will be part of a uh, grand publication for uh, the location of everybody that hates mayonnaise. So how many of you are, uh, are anti mayonnaisers? Yeah, whatever. Uh, how many of you don't eat green vegetables? You should eat green vegetables. Um, I don't know. There you go. Any vegans in the crowd? Oh, God. Good. No, wonderful. All right. So um, we'll have some readings, assignments. We'll have some kind of exam -y thing. Um, we probably will also have some sort of like little quiz thing. The way it works if we were here is that every other week, we have an exam. So we wouldn't have an exam next week, but then the week after we'd have an exam. And eh, we'll see how that goes. Um, so today's goal is to do a couple of things. Uh, first, today we're going to be looking at food labels. And what I hope to do, and I hope to remember, is to provide you, uh, when I send you this video, to tell you to get some kind of really good processed food and have that with you as we go through this. And you can sing along with me as we go through the food labels. My go-to uh, processed food is always my Little Debbie Swiss cake roll. Um, we also have the Hostess uh, Cream Cheese Danish. And just truth in advertising, I do have a bit of an audience here. Uh, my offspring, Igor, is in the back. He may be joining us to demonstrate the proper consumption of a Little Debbie Swiss cake roll. I think he is a consuming a cheese Danish right now. Uh, How is the cheese Danish, Igor? Six and a half out of 10, I'd say. Could be cheesier. He says it's a six and a half out of 10, could be cheesier. We'll check in with him later. All right, so Little Debbie Swiss cake rolls. First off, um, I don't know what you got, but hopefully it's got a label on it. Second, I gotta get into this guy. You gotta sample this rig. You'll note that I never edit my videos. This is live. All right. So, um, how many of you are label readers? Just curious, show of hands. Now, um, I've got a label up here on my big TV that I'll show you in just a moment. We're going to shift over. Um, I'm going to take a new picture, though, of my little Debbie because what I had up there wasn't quite right. Um, so, the labels, hold on a second. Yeah, there we go. So the labels are actually a contract between the food manufacturer and the eater, i.e. you. And if you start getting too fast and loose with the numbers, the FDA or the USDA will actually come and give you a hard time. So let's see if we can't move the TV. All right. So here we go. Uh, this is my Little Debbie label, and the labels, as I say, are supposed to have a certain degree of accuracy to them. Now, uh, several years ago, um, what is it, the company that makes pirate booty? Um, uh, Roberts? No, it's uh, the... Veggie booty, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, they actually got hauled into court because they actually didn't have the numbers uh, appropriately listed in terms of how nutritious their food was. So, um, first off, we got the serving size. Now, 
Serving size is an interesting game because you can actually affect the amount of calories by changing the serving size. And it seems to be doing a little bit better these days. It used to be, though, that some of these um, soft drinks that people might have that were a big liter but not the full two liter would be listed as having two servings. But, of course, you crack it open, you're going to eat the whole thing. Certainly, there are chips that like look like single serving chips, but they are, in fact, two or three servings. And what they can do is they can say, okay, this is two servings. You're going to eat the whole thing all at once, but that's on you. And so the calorie size and things can be actually lower. Um, so with this, I mean, it's actually fairly legit. We got two cakes, and this is the serving size. And that's seems legit. Just thinking about this, and you can write in the comments or send me an email uh, or tell the whole group. Do you have something where the serving size seems a little hinky? You know, like, give me a break. No one's going to eat half of this uh, package of ramen noodles. Oh, this is a good Swiss cake roll. I'm sorry you're not here to sample it. Anyway, so we have the serving size. Conveniently given to you in grams. Thank you very much. Why? I don't know. And then we have the calories per serving. All right. Now, the calories are an important number. We'll be talking about the biochemistry of calories as we get into the class further. Exactly what this means. Theoretically, it's the amount of heat that can be generated if you were to set this on fire. And it is a relative type of term. I mean, it's not like the amount of heat you get from saying the little debbies is exactly the amount of energy you get in there because there's some inefficiencies. And there's also stuff in here that we can't digest. But it is a relative term that is used. All right. This is really good. Now, we got... Calories, 280. And sometimes the label is actually a little bit different, but um, some of the labels me, will also show the calories from fat. Look around. Do you have one that does that? In fact, let me see if I got one. All right, hold on. I'm telling you, I'm not editing. This is live. Yeah. All right, here's another one of the labels. I'm not sure what this is from. Uh, it may have been a little Debbie, and they may have actually just changed it. Is they break the calories down. So here you got 270 calories total, and then calories from fat, 110. This is something that... I'm not going to go in saying that there's con conspiracies, but I will tell you that A, calories is calories. There are some differences in how you may metabolize them, but they're just calories. B, we really should be getting the bulk of our calories from fat. Eating fat-free food is not a good idea, and yet we constantly are pushing low-fat food. One of my favorites is a bag of Lifesavers. Zero calories of fat. Yeah, big deal. It's filled with calories from sugar. Calories don't make any difference, and they don't really distinguish between one type and the other. You're going to consume them, and if you eat more calories and you start shoving more stuff in than you're breathing out or exercising out, you're going to gain weight. So I don't know why they do this, but they do. All right, so we're going to go back to the live um, brand new one. And let's see, hold on. <laughs> Online learning is the best. All right. So they may have reformulated it. That may be why we have things a little bit different. Interesting. All right. Come back here. There you go. That's as big as we get. All right. So. We have total fat, 12 grams, and then they list the percent daily value. There's a certain level of fat that you should get in your diet. 15% comes from these guys. Now, next we break it down into different kinds of fats. And this again is somewhat disingenuous because saturated fat 
is it all that much worse for you than non-saturated fat? There's a little bit more calories in it. We'll be getting into fats as we get into the semester a little bit further. Trans fats are pretty much a thing of the past. Trans fats, as we'll get into, are a product of um, manipulation, industrial manipulation, where you can take a liquid oil and you can make it into a uh, semi-solid, like a Crisco or margarine. Um, they're not really used so much anymore. A little bit, but not too much. So trans fat is zero. And then the degree of unsaturation. As we talk about fatty acids and fats, we'll get into what this means. And uh, there are certain fats that are probably metabolically better for you than others, sure. But whether you're going to get them from your little Debbie Swiss cake roll, I don't know. Um, cholesterol is another interesting one. Um, cholesterol is uh, from animals. Plants do not have cholesterol. So I got 10 milligrams of cholesterol. Can anybody beat me on that? If you're eating some kind of funky meat product, you might be able to have a lot better. Um, otherwise, if it's vegetarian, you're not getting cholesterol. That doesn't mean you're off the hook for monitoring your cholesterol, though, because we can biosynthesize with cholesterol. You have to have cholesterol in your body to carry out living functions. But next, we have sodium. 140 milligrams. This is coming pretty much from salt. So um, if you've got ramen noodles, the packet is filled with salt. Salt is a really cheap flavor enhancer. It's a way of pretty much taking not so great ingredients and amping up the flavor a bit. I don't know. To me, stuff gets salty really fast. I absolutely never salt my food. Um, I put salt in with my, because of the family, and yeah, there's some things where a little touch of salt will really bring out the flavor, but a lot of times, nah. And until I met my partner, I didn't have a salt shaker in the house. So, um, all right, so um, salt, 140 milligrams, and there's your percent, RDA, 6%. Now, we get into total carbohydrate. And these are the sugars and starches. <clears throat> so we have 28 grams of added sugar. Wow. Uh, the total sugars are 28 grams. Holy smokes. That is not quite, oh, okay, all right. So now up here it's 40 grams of total carbohydrate. So the rest of this, the other, uh, what's 40 minus 28, quickly, quickly, uh, 12 is flour starch the rest of it is good old-fashioned sugar um, either in the form of high fructose corn syrup or sugar and dietary fiber a big fat goose egg who's got something with lots of fiber there are bars like fiber one bars and things like this fiber is essentially indigestible carbohydrate and sadly, it turns out there are a couple of different kinds of fibers. There is just plain old wood pulp, which is cellulose, and that counts as fiber, but it ain't the kind of fiber that's good for you. Then there is soluble fiber. That's the stuff that makes oatmeal really thick and gooey, and that's actually the fiber you want if you're trying to increase your fiber uptake. Fiber is good because it can actually help move your poops along to the body, always nice. Uh, it can also bind up various cholesterol, fats, and things and kind of move them out as well. Uh, not a whole lot of fiber in this. There you go. Lastly, we have protein. Two grams. Proteins we'll be getting into. Meats got a lot of protein. Vegetables have protein in them, not as much as meats, but you can get plenty of protein this way. Now here's something I want you to observe, is that if we look at this list, we see that we got total fat percent, we have cholesterol percent, sodium percent, total carb percent, all the added sugars, and then look down here, protein, and they don't give you the percent, RDA. Hmm, why don't they tell you the percent RDA? One thing I, thing I think about is, we eat such a protein-rich diet here in the good old U.S. of A. that if they were to tell you that, dude, you get all the protein you need for the next three days by eating that chunk of chicken, uh, we might actually reduce our protein consumption. I don't know, but it is a little bit weird. Now, if we go further in, we can see the various kinds of um, vitamins, not much vitamin D, 
calcium, a little bit, uh, iron, a little bit, potassium, not much, and then there's the percent RDA. All right, now, uh, one thing is that on the label, they have certain key words they can uh, to describe the food product. It could be um, a good source of calcium or an excellent source of calcium. And these terms, good and excellent, aren't just vague terms. They actually have to meet specific USDA nutrition standards. So like, you know, if you've got um, this much calcium, but not this much, you're a good source. If you're this much, you're an excellent source. So um, those terms are not just trivial. Now, another thing I think is interesting is, let's see, um, I'm trying to see if these can have it. The Swiss cake rolls, they don't make mention of it being filled with cream or cream filled. And you'll notice uh, with things that are cream filled, they um, probably aren't actually using cream, which is a dairy product and is perishable. You gotta keep it refrigerated and it doesn't have a huge shelf life. Uh, Cream, by the way, is spelled C-R-E-A-M. These things will be labeled C-R-E-M-E, cream, or K-R-E-E-M, or various things. So that's how they get around it, is it ain't really a cream filling in your Oreos, it's a crema filling, because it's not really that way. Let's see what else I got over here. Oh. Cheese Danish, which, depending on how bored I am, I might steal myself for one. Uh, they actually do have cream cheese in them. But all right, now let's go on and let's look at our ingredient list. Let me pull up some good ingredients here. Ah, uh, so one of the things I think it'd be interesting to note is when you look at your food product, how many of you have one of these three things as your top ingredients? Unless you're eating corn chips or Fritos or some kind of meat, uh, you're going to be eating water, sugar, and flour. That's it. All right. Now, what they do is, of course, they can't give you the recipe because it's a secret, but um, they do list the ingredients in their relative order. So, I'm not sure which one this was, but water, sugar, and then a little bit of flour. Yeah. Well, then you have all the different parentheses you have to make your way through. So, this is the enrichment in the flour. Hmm. Good old corn syrup. I cook this corn syrup. Palm oil. One of my favorite oils. Now, we'll be getting into more of these food ingredients later, but I just things to keep in mind. Palm oil is an oil that is semi-solid at room temperature, like coconut oil, and kind of like a, a margarine. And when you're looking for something like this here cream filling, you need something that's going to be a semi-solid. So this ain't cream, it's actually not butter, it is in fact palm oil mixed with sugar. So um, about, oh now 15 years ago, when the trans fats, partially hydrogenated fats, were essentially outlawed. Uh, people began looking for a fat that could be used that would um, have the consistency of butter. And um, palm oil and coconut oil are two good ones. Palm oil has been a huge product now for the past 15 years or so. Um, I'm seeing here over my shoulder, this has got a little bit of tallow, that's beef fat. And then we got the two percent or less, all the weird things, uh, modified cornstarch, soybean oil, egg white, um, all sorts of ideas. Cellulose gum, probably keep things from sticking. Uh, mono and diglycerides. When we get into fats and oils, we'll talk about these. These are some of the things that your average baker can't get their hands on. You probably can get a, a freight car load from, from ADM, but they're part of what makes 
um, commercial prepared, you know, breads, kind of that gooeyness is having these different kinds of fractions of fats. And, mmm, so I put protein, a little guar gum, probably keep things uh, uh, thick and gooey. Um, then, various small amounts of material that are part of the baking soda. Um, Apply sorbate 80. This is a or 60. These are anti mold agents and uh, preservatives that keep stuff from getting oxidized and getting too uh, funky tasting. All right. That was 25 minutes worth of me eating and gassing on. Are you done? We're going to pause now because loading things that are too long could be hard, and my God. The thought of you sitting in front of a computer listening to me gas on for longer than 25 minutes deeply frightens me. So I'm going to stop this one, take a moment. We're going to pick back up with some basic chemistry and the structure of the atomic bond and see where we go from there. Bye.